Okay, evening everybody um, and welcome to another one of our, our joint webinars from across the region. Um, tonight on, on the panel is all the lead officers from across the East area um, and Matt Blakely has kindly joined us again from the ECB to help us go through the guidelines. Um, this one is a, is a webinar so obviously as participants you're behind so you're all muted you won't be able to take questions but there are Q&A boxes down the bottom if you'd like to put any comments and questions there and we'll, we'll, if we haven't gone through them in the webinar um, we'll then try and pick up two or three of them at the end and if we don't manage to get through all of them or they start to be specific then we'll make sure one of the lead officers will follow up with you at the end. Um, again it's another great turnout we're up over 100 people on the webinar again which just shows the, the passion and the interest in the game and trying to all help us work together in terms of supporting the games in our local communities as we go forward. So um, I'm going to pass on to Matt now. Um, start off. Over to you Matt. Cheers, Dan. And just echoing Dan's uh, thanks for everybody taking the time and joining us tonight. I think it's a um, much more exciting time than it was a few weeks ago. The, there's very much a, a positive vibe around about getting back towards cricket. Um, but I think this first slide just sums up that, that cautious approach of whilst it is getting a little bit closer and steps have been taken to allow groups to come back together, I think it's just worth reminding that we are in a in a significant public health um, situation and the overriding kind of priorities around people's safety and keeping people safe. So um, everything that we say tonight is is about how we can support cricket to come back and allow people to come and enjoy the game that we all love. But just having at the centre of it, just um, this government kind of advice really. So from an ECB perspective, our conversations with government are very much taking a lead on um, making sure government are comfortable with steps that we're taking, that we're not overstretching ourselves or doing anything that we shouldn't be to allow us to come back when we can come back as a game and play what we class as uh, the traditional game that we should be playing at this time of year, that it's it's done safely and with the government's backing. So all your help and support on, on, on these stages and these steps that we're taking is hugely appreciated. And just uh, bear with us. It may not seem that we're moving very quickly, but we're trying to do it as safely and to protect the people that are involved in the game. Uh, Dan, can you go on to the next slide, mate? So here's just a, a couple of slides of information we shared with, with the county board. So just reiterating to the network, really. Um, from an ECB perspective, we want to make sure that the public's protected first and foremost, and they're the people that use our facilities and our clubs and, and, and that make up our volunteer network that, that run the game for us during the summer. We also want to make sure that the game's sustained and we keep the lights on um, and through all this that we're working in partnership. The bottom slide um, shows a little bit of a, a journey that we're on at the moment. And at each of those stages, uh, you can see at the bottom of those columns is a blue box around guidance and clarity. So every time we, we think about changing or we hear changes from government, we just want to make sure we've got the right guidance and clarity from DCMS and from um, the Chief Medical Officer's um, office in Westminster, or virtually in Westminster at the moment, and that we've got that, that real clear guidance so we can allow people to move forward. And we're very much moving now from a phase of protecting the game and looking after the game to preparing to get ready to play. Um, and that yellow box just shows that we're in between those two strands. So whilst there's some movement, um, we still need to look after protecting the game, but we are getting ready and getting a bit more excited and optimistic about the future and playing the game shortly. Um, Dan, if you click on to the next slide, please. So this um, just shows some of our thinking. So this is um, a little bit confidential at the moment. So we'll be sharing this um, this roadmap or a version of this roadmap with the public later on this week. So, But being on this webinar, I wanted to share kind of our thinking and where we've come from. So from full lockdown in step one, where we were um, several weeks ago, we've started seeing those gradual steps to unlocking. So step three in the middle is where we're at today in terms of um, groups of six and being able to coach. The next stage um, we anticipate will be kind of an expanded version of that. And we're just working through all the different elements that sit within there in terms of adapted gameplay, how clubs can bring juniors back into their, onto their fields safely, how we can get some of the structures around that, how we can get some shorter format and some adjusted games happening um, in club land before we then step into what we class as unrestricted play, which is 11 aside league cricket, which I think we all hope will be coming sooner rather than later. But, the caveat with all of this is because of that public health situation, whilst we're looking at step four optimistically, 
there's a reality that in, in the next few weeks, we could always be moving back towards step two or step one. And we've got to have that in the back of our minds as a game that whilst we're optimistic and when the sun's shining outside, it's easy to be optimistic. The health agenda that sits behind this and the agenda from government is about protecting people's lives ultimately. So whilst we all want to go and play cricket when that's, that's really positive, I think just having in the back of people's minds that whilst we could move forward in the next few weeks, we could just as easily move backwards. And it's one of the reasons that the ECB has been a little bit reluctant in, in sharing any sort of journey like this, because it's not a one-way journey. It's a journey that's going to have steps forward and backwards over the next coming months. Um, and that depends on so many factors that are outside of our control. But just to give comfort to the people on the call today, that as a, as a game, we've got, we've got those plans and we're working through what that looks like. Um, but the, the nervousness, as I say, is that this could be a, whilst a positive forward journey, it could also be going backwards at some point, And we've just got to have that in the back of our minds. Um, I'm going to pass over to Rob now. I think it's going to take us through the, uh, the guidance in a little bit more detail and I'll pick up any questions later on. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so we've obviously got the outdoor cricket facilities there and most of those are obviously self-explanatory from the one-to-one -one, um, coaching that we had previously that was sent out, um, I think just over a week ago. So we, we talked about obviously, you know, do not use your facility if obviously a member of your household has symptoms. Um, I think that that's a fairly obvious one. I think the thing around sort of washing your hands um, and health and hygiene, Sam's going to come on to in a moment. So um, if, if I just quickly pass over to Sam, he'll go through that next slide that, that Dan has very kindly brought up. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, apologies for some reason. Uh, I can't get on camera, but you can hear me, hopefully. Uh, so I'll crack on with uh, a few bits just around uh, health and hygiene for me. Um, firstly, just talking about symptoms. Anyone obviously uh, with showing, uh, showing symptoms leading up to a session should, should follow the government advice and, and of course, stay at home. Um, uh, and following that after a session through the, through the booking systems, hopefully uh, clear that any individuals that do develop any symptoms, uh, they must contact a club official uh, to make them aware that they're uh, showing some symptoms. Um, that enables the club to be able to track and trace um, using that system um, of booking. Um, and that ensures that both the appropriate ratios are adhered to uh, leading up to a session, um, but also uh, following that session, the, the club are able to look back on which individual you, individuals were using the nets at specific times um, so that that tracing can take place um, that, that's necessary. Um, hand hygiene is still really important, uh, especially in scenarios where equipment is being shared, which I think Rob's going to allude to in his next slide. Uh, where possible, encourage groups and individuals uh, to bring your own hand sanitizer and wipes to support good practice relating to hygiene at your clubs. And finally, uh, similar to the original guidance that are sent out, um, it's, it's sort of upon the clubs to decide whether or not they feel obliged to open their facilities for up to groups of six. Um, if, they, if they don't feel comfortable to do so, then, then of course they do not have to. Uh, you may wish to remain closed completely uh, or only have one-to-ones, family groups in the nets, or, or limiting training to a specific area of your club. So you might just want to run outfield training or perhaps some fitness sessions. Uh, slide seven on to you, Rob. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so the first thing is obviously uh, the clear net gap and cages and middles and stuff like that. And I think we want to break it down into two groups. So you've obviously got your juniors. Um, obviously, if you're running junior sessions, you, you must have a lead coach uh, on site and obviously looking after a group. If you've then got subsequent groups of obviously five players because the coaches count as a player, you can have, for example, a CSW working with another group, but ensuring that you adhere to the, the guidelines that Sam's just touched upon about, obviously, the social distancing and, and things like that. Um, in terms of adults, whilst the coach isn't mandatory, um, you'll still need a club representative on site um, just to make sure that, obviously, the procedures the club have put in place are obviously being adhered to. I think some of the considerations, a lot of the focus has been around of the actual playing and how that would kind of work within clubs. Um, I'd also ask clubs to consider, you know, about the sort of the toilets and the parking. Um, so whilst it'd be great if we could have, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 kids on the outfield, you know, taking place in their little groups of six. You need to remember, obviously, at some stage they might need access to toilets. How is that going to work? Obviously, you're going to have parents turning up in their cars, you know, car parks can be a bit restrictive at cricket grounds. So just take that into consideration. So whilst you might have a big field out there, 
just think about how many children realistically um, and people on site you could have that could safely hear to obviously all the guidelines have been touched upon. Um, I think the other thing is um, around obviously the parents as well is it's very important obviously that parents if you know a net session is being taken place or obviously their child is, is, is active on the outfield that the parents are able to watch from a safe distance and you might want to have obviously an area if it's a one-to-one -one coaching that was talked about last week um, or obviously you know parents can stay in their cars if they can still see what's going on and I know that Phil's going to bring up obviously the safeguarding element later in this session. Um, when we're talking about obviously um, nets and stuff like that I think one of the other things to consider is that you know balls can be hit out of the nets as well um, and you know if you've got a nice flat outfield then the ball can travel a, a long distance and, and might be inadvertently picked up by another group and obviously throw them back so you know think about you know could, could you have a little safety net up that could act as a barrier to stop the ball being hit away from the group that you're actually working with um, so little things like that um, could easily make a big difference we talked about signage as well. So not only do the players need to know where they're going and if you've got a one-way system and stuff like that, but also the parents as well. So, you know, look for any pinch points, you know, how you're going to sort of cover that and manage that situation. Um, and I think the signage really just, just helped reinforce the club reps and coaches that are on site just to say, as a club, this is what we're looking to try and do. And if you can obviously, you know, put that guidance out to your members that are using the facilities beforehand, then even better. Uh, the last bit is probably one of the most important ones is around equipment. Uh, the recommendation is that obviously, you know, wherever possible, players bring their own equipment. Uh, now, we, we are realistic and appreciate that on occasions that's not possible. Um, so if in those scenarios where, you know, coach has got to maybe share some, you know, the, the equipment, whether it's, you know, balls and stuff like that, um, coaches can maybe use six balls for one player um, and then obviously rotate them around or make sure that obviously sanitization, so you know, all equipment is thoroughly cleaned in between sessions uh, before and after use, um, just to make sure that that can be done. I think when you're running a net session is that the batter, if a coach is doing throwdowns, the coach will need to wear obviously a mitt and a glove to, to field the ball, um, and then obviously can throw those to the batter for them to have a go at hitting. Uh, the batter would normally return the ball either by kicking it back or obviously with, with tapping it back gently with your bat. Um, bowlers, the idea once again is that bowlers use their own ball um, because obviously it reduces the risk of obviously having to share equipment. But once again, if it has to be done, then please just consider you know, the, your sanitization process and how that may work. Um, ultimately, you know, a good risk assessment beforehand will ensure that you've got all the measures in place to make sure that something works. But I also say, if, if you've run a session, then don't be afraid to review it afterwards and just say, yeah, you know, 99% of it went well, but actually in hindsight, it'd be good if we just tweaked a little bit of the procedure to make sure it's even better next time. So don't sort of be steadfast that you've got a procedure in place and that's how it's going to be for the next sort of two or three weeks, however long it is. Um, and that's really it as far as sort of equipment is concerned. So Dan, I don't know if you want to take on to the next slide, please. Cheers, Rob. Um, thanks for highlighting a number of things there. I think it's really important just to stress something that Rob picked up um, at the start of his previous slide. Um, and it's something that us, as anyone running any session, whether it be juniors or adults, um, really making sure that we do adhere to the ECB Safe Hands guidance at all times. Um, and that's really clear whether we're doing net sessions or whether we're doing small groups out on the outfield. Um, and really making sure that we have got our qualified coaches, just making sure... Um, we've got the correct amount, whether it be for the nets or outside. And again, if you are unsure about that, please do liaise with your club welfare officer who should be completely aware of those ratios. But alternatively, hopefully your coaches should be as well. Um, and, and just to really reiterate, as well as your qualified coaches, we need to make sure we've got the appropriate um, amount of adults there as well, present at the session over the age of 18 with a registered DBS. Um, a basic guide, obviously, we, we know that Foundation 1 coaches are qualified coaches and Level 2. Um, over the years, we know there's been some slight changes on that, but generally as a hard, fast rule, um, qualified coaches come under that bracket. In terms of groups rotating round, um, really do make sure, again, as Rob said, add it into your risk assessment if we're going to be rotating groups round on the outfield. Try and make sure that as a group is working together, that they stay with that coach where they can. 
Um, if they are required to move around and use the same equipment, make sure that sanitization process is in place um, to try and avoid touch points where you can. Um, and it's all about really mitigating that risk to ensure that we can make it safe for everyone involved in our session as possible. Um, and as Rob did allude to, really do make sure you really reflect after your first session, see how it went, and there's nothing wrong with reflecting, realizing actually we might need to change something. Um, Takeaway refreshments, there's been quite a lot of chat on this on social media. Um, I know a lot of people have questioned whether we can or can, cannot do this. Um, we're still waiting on some further guidance on this from ECB um, as to whether we can have takeaway you know, refreshments. Um, but please do watch this space. We'll try and get some current guidance out to you um, as to what can take place because the current guidance from government is that it's takeaway only and we're trying to avoid people buying stuff and then eating it on site, which then might create um, a situation where we've got lots of people in that same vicinity, which we're trying to avoid. In terms of gameplay, it's something that we all know we'd love to get back to as soon as we can. Um, but just to really highlight that as per the current guidance, no matches are able to take place um, and recreational matches are still suspended. Simple practices that incorporate up to six people on the outfield in the nets are completely fine. But in terms of actual gameplay and match play at this point, unfortunately, we still can't do that. Um, as Matt alluded to earlier, as per that roadmap that ECB are looking to produce, hopefully we can get to that next stage as soon as possible. But just whilst we're in this current phase, it is simply practice and training early only and making sure that we do adhere to the ECB guidance that has been released shortly or has been released currently, sorry. Um, for anyone, if you, if you do want obviously more on coaching, obviously please don't hesitate to get in touch with your, re your local rep. Um, but also in terms of return to activity guidance, it's pages 10 to 12, where there is more information about one-to-one -one coaching specifically, and also the group coaching. Um, there will be lots of individual questions about how it will work at your club. Um, and we're now going to head over to Ben, who's going to take us through just a few key parts, particularly on that risk assessment. So Dan, do you want to just move forward? Cool, thanks, Lewis. Um, just reiterating again, guys, in terms of um, what's been said on the call already, obviously groups are now um, able to be up to six people, um, but obviously maintaining the social distancing guidelines at all time. Uh, one thing we will say, it's, it's basically up to clubs to um, be able to risk assess whether they feel comfortable in delivering um, sessions to up to six people. Particularly an example of that is in a net situation um, with regards to enclosed nets. Um, it might be that the space in the net doesn't allow you to or you don't feel comfortable with that social distancing with um, four bowlers, a batter and a coach. Um, so it's completely up to you. If you feel that is not you're not happy with that then you could use an example of a group of four, which I'll, I'll go on to a little bit later. Um, simple, there's been some questions in the chat box around activities that can be done. Um, I'd encourage everyone to look at um, iCoach Cricket. Um, if you haven't logged onto it already, obviously it's, it's a simple process, but if you do have an iCoach Cricket account, there are lots of um, fielding games, small-sided small -sided um, practices that you can undertake within your groups that are available to be looked at on there. Um, iCoach Cricket also now has a Twitter feed, um, which is at iCoach Cricket, and there have been some good examples of small-sided small practices on there. Already, one was a bowling practice, um, I think it was on yesterday, and there's some good examples of the coach using social distancing and keeping all um, five bowlers interacting um, and on the move at, at the same time during the session. So I'd encourage all of you um, guys to have a look at that and encourage your coaches as well. Um, there's just an example as well below of the risk assessment. Um, and a sim uh, this one is one that Essex have carried out. And just taking into example, any practices that you want to do, we encourage you to have a look at the risk factors that might be taking place and what actions are required to make sure that you're adhering to the guidelines, both the ECB guidelines and the government guidelines around social distancing, including sharing of equipment um, and the sanity, hand sanity, um, et cetera, et cetera. So 
please, 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 when you're doing, you're looking at your sessions and what you can run, um, please undertake the risk assessment and have a look at potentially any of the mitigations that you might want to put in place to have make sure that that impact and that risk is low. Um, I've just got a couple of examples here. Um, one, a live example from my club, um, that is we have this situation where our net isn't big enough um, to socially distance four bowlers. So our one of our practices that we put in place is that we have, it's only a two bay net facility. So obviously one of them is out of action. We have a coach in there, um, a batter and two bowlers. And just off to the side, we have a, a small area where the other two players are undertaking some conditioning exercises, socially distancing. Um, and we've put it into a scenario sessions where that's the bowler, where the bowlers, current bowlers will bowl two overs each. So 24 balls at the batter. And then they, the, those two players will leave the net and the other two players will come back in and they'll swap into their, into their conditioning. And then that batter will have 48 balls and then, and then they will rotate around. So that's just an example. Um, another example from another club is that they have decided to continue with just the one-to-one um, net situation and then run some small group sessions under the guidelines on the outfield. Um, an example of that would be potentially two groups of six people. Um, one is a supervisory adult coach support worker, five players in both of the groups overseen by a qualified coach. Um, obviously they've got three different bubbles there, the qualified coach on their own and the two bubbles enabling them to do some field in uh, small group sessions on the outfield. Um, I think we've got a live example on the screen there as well, which has been provided by a club and, um, Obviously, you can see that they've split it into time slots um, and gone from four, five, six, seven with age groups in each time slot. I think this has come from Wanstead. Um, so if anybody has got any questions or would like some further information around how they have decided to do it, then um, please pop your any details in the Q&A or the chat box and we'll get um, that passed on to Wanstead who can provide some further details. Um, I think we are now um, moving on to just cover a little bit more around the safeguarding. So I'm going to hand over to Phil, who's going to take us through um, the safeguarding requirements and just some reminders and guidance on those. Thanks, Ben. And as you heard, um, some really good examples of uh, how we can establish cricket. And uh, the big thing is that safe hands continues to be the policies and procedures that we all need to adhere to. Uh, so we continue to make sure that those people there who are working with a level two qualified coach still needs to be DBS checked. Uh, if clubs need to get a DBS check, it's a very straightforward process. It's working very efficiently at the moment. Uh, they just need to follow the advice from the, uh, the, the county reps. Uh, we've all become very used to using these Zoom sessions. Uh, and just a few points about that, some good practice around the, the various counties. Um, at the moment we're saying Zoom meetings should not be recorded unless the club has got written permission from everybody who's actually logged on. And that's quite challenging uh, in a way. Uh, we've also need to make sure that when you are logging anybody on uh, to a Zoom session, it's the parents and carers who are using their mobiles. Um, one of the things we've actually said is that we want the parents to turn the screen onto themselves before it starts so we can make sure that the kids are not using their own mobiles without any parents. And clearly the most important thing really is that um, if children are getting involved in, in uh, coaching sessions, which is a brilliant example, it's following a lot of other good practice from different sports around, then we need to make sure that it's done so in an environment and it's risk assessed and it's the parents' re responsibility to risk assess their own garden if they're using a garden to make sure that there are no potential accidents, kids falling over, bricks, hazards or whatever else. So um, all of that is available. Uh, if anybody wants any further information about um, Zoom meetings, but as I say, I can't stress enough that, uh, that. Safe Hands training for um, the existing uh, club welfare officer whose um, issues have uh, run out because um, they haven't been able to do a face-to-face -face course. They will be contacted by the ECB over the next week or so, inviting them to an online classroom, two and a half hour training session, 
um, that will be have a 12 month validity. If you as a club have uh, a newly uh, appointed club welfare officer, then you need to let your various county rep know uh, who that is. Um, the county rep will then be able to arrange with the ECB and they will provide them with an invitation to do that, that training. Um, just be patient that obviously ECB has just come out this week. So there is, it is taking some time to get them. But I know from a fact, speaking to people, it is working and people are being signed up very efficiently for these courses. Um, also the Safeguarding and Protecting Children course, uh, SYC, uh, they need to make sure that is kept up to date. And again, it's the ECB safeguarding team that will be able to give appointments for that uh, qualifications. Um, if there is anything, when it comes around to um, working with young people, particularly in a net situation, group coaching situation, you can find safe hands very easily. If you just Google ECB safe hands, all the policies will come up. So for instance, I've got the ECB guidance on supervising children at the cricket session. It's, it, it's there, it's available. And if you need anything, then you can very quickly understand and bring it up. Uh, you might need to use some of this for posters information um, on nets to make sure that everybody is complying with good safeguarding child protection practice throughout all the counties. Any, if there's any questions about that later, I'd be more than happy to take them. But I think that's enough for me at the moment. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, thanks, everyone. Else. Um, just we're going to go on to the questions. Just I see there's a few questions coming up, but um, just to help you there with following on Phil's point, all of the contact details for the lead officers and for Phil are on the page at the moment, so you can get that. Um, and then just following on from this, just to update you as well, the next wave of webinars are coming forward. So this Thursday. We have one around club development plans, which um, Simon Cooper, who was the head of sport for London um, during the time of the Olympics and other major events, is going to help us around that point in terms of developing those plans. We're then going to look at wider community opportunities. And then uh, next week, we've got women and girls cricket. And then following that, we're just confirming following one of the points that's been raised to me as well is around with the groundsmen, because actually now we're looking at that potential getting into stage three uh, and potentially step four. Um, how we have those conversations with our groundsmen around what that looks like and any potential knock-on around end of season work. So it's those kind of conversations as well that are starting to happen within clubs as we go through. So just going back to the panel um, and looking through the questions. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, so both field and perspective and also the underage group, the government guidelines, if you're sharing equipment. So Matt, did you just want to confirm around the bit around the small groups on the outfield and like the sharing of equipment and that kind of stuff? Yeah, so <clears throat> so where possible, we want to avoid um, avoid sharing equipment. Um, and I think the guys covered that quite well earlier, talking about how um, groups move around the field and move from station to station. So um, the balls bit has been <laughs> one that's caused lots of not only chuckles but uh, questions and uncertainty around how that works and and how that works so every every child every participant in the drill should have their own ball um be fed into a into a mitt if, as long as hands are washed beforehand and equipment's washed between sessions that that's reducing the risk as much as possible and this is all about not we can't make this 100 percent safe this is all about mitigating as much risk as possible throughout the game so making sure that all the steps that are in the guidance should be should be followed that the cleaning of the equipment the washing of hands um avoiding touching people's faces saliva on the ball all those different bits we've seen through there so it, it's about mitigating that, that risk as much as possible rather than making it absolutely safe so i think when it comes to any sort of groups and there's some mention all there about stumps as well i think in the questions um it's just about applying some common sense um looking at how you mitigate some of that contact and making sure that you're doing all the steps you can to, to reduce your participants' risk from any sort of um, exchange of, of the virus. Sure. And Matt, while you just said, did you want to pick up, just building on from Lewis's point, the conversation's going on around the refreshment bits? Just in a couple of bits. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of questions have landed since since the guidance came out on clubs opening up for takeaway, and it was absolutely right. The the takeaway guidance is for for restaurants, hotels. It's not something directed necessarily at the volunteer sector. So from our position, well, it's we're talking about groups of six or clusters of groups of six in a club. We don't see that as a as a huge step forward for a volunteer led um, club environment or majority. Club, so it's for me. It's about making the clubs making their own call. Is it worth going through that to sell five cups of coffee to the parents that come down that are then going to go and sit in their car and drink it? So the measures that you have to put in place, the steps that you're going to have to put in place within the clubhouse to open up any sort of facility for for retail um, are going to be quite significant. So it's a it's a very simple kind of cost benefit analysis to t- undertake. Is it worth the hassle and process of putting that in place to open up for? For takeaway, Dan's been given the advice quite rightly of chatting to local authorities. Um, if there is a, a bigger infrastructure and something that's, that's worthwhile and feasible, then that's absolutely fine and take take your own look at the guidance. But for, for most clubs, um, it will be relatively small scale at the moment until we start moving back to bigger numbers. Um, there was a question around if we have two groups of five, can we play a match of softball cricket? Fletch, have you got an answer to that one? Yeah, I can. Can, it, can people hear me? Because I've been on mute. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, mate. Hi, hi, ladies and gents. Um, well, the answer is no. No games. It's it's pretty simple. We can't play them. It, it was quite explicit in the roadmap that had been shown in one of the documents. I know it's not completely official yet, but it's just no games at the moment. And someone has put a question about when are we likely, if you're optimistic, to get to stage four? I might as well pick the lottery numbers. It was fairly well described earlier that this could go back and forth depending on how the rate of infection or whatever um, stat the government's using. So we don't know. We could be back at stage two after this weekend. We could be back at stage one in two weeks if there's a huge increase in coronavirus. So we all want to get to stage four and ultimately end up playing proper cricket again. But, you know, it's just a guesswork. So no games at the moment until instructed. And unfortunately, everything else would be a guess, I'm afraid. Um, Bill, thanks. Yes. Bill, there's one around, I don't know if you might have helped around safeguarding, around public parks and setting up around public parks and sort of insurance and, um, and that point around making sure they're risk mitigation and possible if you're walking through parks, where the parks become very popular. Do you have any bits around that point? I, th- I think the biggest thing about parks is particularly if you're using nets where the ball could be hit at some distance, could be picked up by uh, other people, picked up by dogs. Um, I think that's going to be a really big, uh, it's going to be up to the level two DBS um, checked coach to do a risk assessment wherever they are. And that may change during the day. That might vary in terms of people around. Um, but I think the, the one thing we've got to avoid is to get any of the sort of the bad news stories, which uh, will be seized upon. And if, cricket kind of show it's a, it's a responsibly run sport, um, then I think we've got a problem where we could be even longer before we get back. So I think if everybody takes it seriously, hopefully we're going to stop some of these games that are being played on parks. Um, I, I think it's, you know, our responsibility is to make sure that cricket can be seen to be a sport that's delivering recreational activities for young people responsibly. Uh, and if they, if everybody complies with the guidelines, I mean, today's um, work from all the guys there, the risk assessments, the advice is absolutely first class. So if anybody is not certain, certainly the slides, forward the slides onto people, uh, check out safe hands and make sure we, we all comply with the regulations. Dan, just on that Parks piece, if I can, I think just reiterating that back to what we said about the Nets, this isn't a, you have to do this, this is if it's right to do so. So just taking that, that, pause and saying is it safe for us to run these training sessions if the park's going to be um, attended by the public and going to have huge openings and groups in, on the public space so how would you normally do that on a Friday night or your usual training night and look at those measures and how you would put them in place and if you can't do it safely you don't have to do it this isn't a dictation from the ECB for you to open up your club for groups of six to train it's when it's safe for you to do so within your own environment. And did you just want to pick up on a bit around All Stars and Dynamite as well? Yeah, so um, in terms of national programmes, uh, All Stars in particular, um, 
we are looking at, at what that looks like during the summer. Um, there was some conversations around whether that works in a in a group of six. Um, the the intention of All Stars was always around um, large groups of kids coming together and having a great time, not just doing cricket for the sake of it. So until we can get those, until those groups allow us to do bigger groups than just six, then All Stars will remain postponed and we'll update as and when we know kind of moving forward into steps four, four and five, as we talked about earlier. Um, All Stars will be picked up on that, but we expect that to be later on in the summer. Thanks. And Ben, just one final, there was a coach head one there just to wrap up. Um, if someone's going through their current level two and haven't done their assessment, can they still support a group alongside that? Um, if they have a, for it, taking in the example of um, if they could supervise a group of five children under the guidance of another level two coach, for the example. So if you had a level two coach and you had then two other two groups separate the coach could be in the middle socially distancing um, and the two groups further apart socially distancing with a supervisor and five children those coaches undertaking their level twos could be the supervisory adult within those groups of six yes thank you i'm just conscious of time so we'll, if the other questions we'll pick up and we'll come back to independently I see there's a few around they'll get picked up more we're around the gameplay um, like I said, just to reinforce, with, we're at stage um, three at the moment. It's small group activity, um, looking into it. You've seen some ways and ideas. We can help out with any of the templates that people have asked for. So please drop us an email if you want those templates. Like I said, the lead officers are here. We can help you around those points. And then hopefully collectively, we still keep working as a game and the community. We can get close to that step four point where actually adaptive games will come through. Um, and I know there's plenty of meetings going on with the leagues over the next couple of weeks around what that might look like as we go forward. And there'll be more information. And we'll certainly, as we get that information, we'll look to run another webinar to keep you updated. But currently it's around, let's try and help to reactivate our clubs, get people back playing safely and supporting our communities. Um, and again, please just stay in touch if you've got any other questions. But thank you again to the whole panel. Um, and thank you very much to all of you for, for joining us this evening. Stay safe.